Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Thinking Like a Bank, where we show you how to think like a bank by applying the same strategies and principles that banks use to help you find more financial freedom. I'm your host, Sarah Ibrahim. With us today, I have a very special guest. His name is David C. Barnett. He's an author, speaker, advisor, and former business broker. David loves to say that it took him 10 years to unlearn what he was taught in business school. University had trained him to be a middle manager in big enterprises. He was totally unprepared for the realities of small business. After a career in advertising sales, David started several businesses, including a commercial debt brokerage house. Helping to finance small and medium-sized businesses led to the field of business brokerage. Over several years, David sold dozens of businesses for others while also managing his own portfolio of income properties and starting his career as a local private investor. David regularly consults with professionals and banks on business and asset values. Currently, he also works with entrepreneurs and would-be entrepreneurs around the world who are buying, selling, or trying to improve their businesses. David, welcome to our show. Hey, Sari. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I'm a big fan of your show, your podcast, your YouTube channel. I think it's very informative. Uh, I think it's a must for a lot of small business owners to check out. Um, before we jump into that, do you mind sharing more about, more about your background and what you do? Yeah, sure. So um, as you said in the in the bio there, I've a, got a varied background as far as um, education and work history and everything. I've worked in advertising and I've worked, um, you know, in banking before. I had a commercial debt brokerage at one time, which meant I was helping entrepreneurs to get money. And that's what led me into business brokerage. I started to meet business owners who were looking for money to buy operating businesses. And it was in that finance brokerage capacity that I learned to start doing my own small private lending deals. And basically I learned by observing what I was doing and what I was asked to do on behalf of some of the lenders and leasing companies that I was doing deals with. So I'll give you one you know, quick example. Uh, there was one case where a business was being purchased and someone was using uh, lease financing for uh, some of the vehicles. And so this multi-billion dollar equipment leasing company sent me a power of attorney, just little old David, all of a sudden I got a power of attorney. It was very limited. It said right on it that it was a power of attorney, attorney that allowed me to act on their behalf to, to change two vehicle registration slips. And so uh, because they needed somebody locally to go down to the DMV and change the vehicle registrations to put their name on the title. And, and, in, and then send them, you know, copies of that via email so that they would be able to, to forward the funds and know that the registration had been done properly. And so I was privy to all the paperwork that these people were using in doing their deals. And, you know, banks and other finance companies are some of the most profitable entities in our economy, and they're not known for taking big risks. And so what I learned during that time is that the, the idea we have that big returns come with big risks is actually not uh, true. Um, some of the biggest, most profitable enterprises out there take very little risk. And these would be the, the finance companies and the banks. And so I started to learn by observing what they were doing. And one day I had an opportunity to put everything I learned into practice. When someone came in, they had a very small business and like a lot of small businesses, they were running things in such a way that their tax returns didn't reveal the true profitability of the, of the business, but they needed to replace some kitchen equipment. They, were, they had a small kitchen in their business and they were looking basically for a few thousand dollars worth of equipment. And they wanted to get some kind of lease or something. And I, and I just knew that the deal was way too small for any of the lenders I was using to take them seriously or even want to accept an application. So I pretended that they were approved. And I basically plagiarized all the documentation from some of these other companies and put it in the name of my own company. And I put forward the money. And over the course of the next 18 months, this lady made all her payments and I learned you know, how to do these deals. And then I started to expand from there. And, and there was a big hiccup that came in my business when the big financial crisis hit in 08, 09. That's what led me to go into business brokerage because a lot of the finance companies I was dealing with went under in that period. But what I learned as far as doing those deals stayed with me and I started to do it more and more just from my own personal investment angle, I guess. Um, and I ended up writing about it in 2014. I had, it was my very first book that ever came out called Invest Local. Mm -hmm. And I, I documented the methodology and the process that I use for going out and doing these deals and most importantly, why? Um, and the why is simply this. 
small businesses, uh, their interest expense is an expense for tax reasons. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, when they think about the interest rate that a loan is, you know, on a loan, they're thinking about it from their own personal point of view. So if you borrow money to buy something, sorry, um, mm -hmm. you then have to make that payment with after-tax dollars from whatever it is you do to earn an income. However, in a business, mm -hmm. businesses make their loan payments and, and have the interest expense as a pre-tax deduction. It's like any other expense in their business. And so for small businesses, when they look at the interest rate that is being charged on something, they, they can have to consider the before versus after tax position that puts them in. So for a small business owner, if you start to look around at what they're charged as far as interest rates and lease rates, et cetera, the rates tend to be higher than what you see in the world of personal, mm -hmm. um, personal borrowing. And so the rates of return potentially are more lucrative in the business space and uh, there's no reason why people can't do exactly what the banks do. I do exactly what I was taught to do by the banks, which is to have fully collateralized loans or leases that are backed by something tangible. And I'm sure we'll get into this more during today's conversation. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it puts me in a position where I'm not actually at risk if something were to go wrong. And there are different ways that we can do the paperwork and arrange our relationship with the borrower to make it more attractive for them to come and do business with someone like me than to go to the bank. And that has to do with the whole world of credit reporting and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing that sometimes business owners want to avoid. Got it. Now, um, in your, in, for example, in your first example with lending, did you use just regular cash or did you, did you leverage a retirement account or can you tell us more about how you started like cash? -wise? So that first deal was just a few thousand dollars. I just mm -hmm. used money that I had available. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. And, and here's the thing to, to remember, if you go and buy like a, like a, what do you call it? A, um, a, a guaranteed um, investment certificate or mm -hmm. some kind of term deposit at a bank, a, a CD at a mm -hmm. bank. You put in 2000 and it's stuck there for the term. When you do a deal like this, you put out the money and then 30 days later, you get your first payment. Yeah. And the first payment is principal and interest. Yeah. So if there's 24 payments, you actually get all your money back before then. So from a lender's point of view, the exposure and the risk starts to decline literally 30 days after you do the deal. Yeah. The money starts to roll back in. And so, so it was out of my own cash flow but I didn't miss it for long. And the net result was that I ended up obviously with more money than what I had put out originally. Mm -hmm. at, over the course of time, I started to get more and more creative. So um, at one point I used a line of credit and I borrowed against the line of credit to do one of these deals. And in another instance, I actually created the, the deal, the loan with my own money. And then I sold an interest in the note that I had created to another investor to recoup part of the money. And that's an example of a leveraged deal. So mm -hmm. what I did is I, I made a loan to someone at one interest rate, and then I used that piece of paper. Remember mm -hmm. my piece of paper is called a promissory note. It holds as collateral or a guarantee some object of tangible value. In this case, it was a single wide mobile home, okay? And then what I did is I offered my note as collateral to a buddy of mine who was interested in investments, but I offered him half the interest rate that I was getting. So what I was able to do in that instance is I was able to then pull back most of my money out of the deal, but I collected the spread. The difference between what I was paying him and what I was collecting from the lady who was buying the, the mobile home. And so that's a, that's a leverage deal. And that's the kind of thing that banks do. Mm -hmm. So a banker will lend you money for a car at a much higher interest rate. And where do they get that money? Well, that's the money they got from someone who bought a CD, mm -hmm. right? And they're, they're making the difference on the spread. And you can do the same thing. And I understand, uh, you know, I started to do this kind of stuff back in 2007, 2008, um, I was only introduced to the whole bank on yourself type whole life insurance policy investment arrangement just a couple of years yeah. ago. And I do that now myself, but I have yet to use a policy loan for financing one of these deals. And, and who are you? Uh, we'll, we'll go back to the bank on yourself in a second, but how did you, who do you lend to? Is it like small businesses, individuals? 
Yeah. So I've got a couple of golden rules. Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, you know, the books on Amazon, it's like 10 bucks or something yeah. on Kindle. But um, some of my golden rules are number one, uh, I need to be connected in some way to the business owner. And so it has to come to me, not through me advertising that I lend money. Yeah. It has to come to me through my network of people that I know. So it's, it's always a friend of a friend or someone connected to a professional colleague or, or something like that. And there's an important reason why I want to do it that way. Uh, number one, I'm not trying to start a real bank. I, mm -hmm. This is a very limited kind of investment thing that I'm doing on my own. Um, that's the first reason. So I don't want this to become too big. Mm -hmm. um, number two, it's really easy if someone gets into trouble to stop paying a bank. Yeah. Because the bank is like this faceless entity, you know, this big evil thing, you know, people like to say bad things about banks, Yes, mm -hmm. but it's really hard to stiff the friend of a friend, Yeah, especially if that connection was made by that mutual friend. And so this is why I want a personal connection with someone, because above all else, I want to be in communication with the person I want money to. Um, if they're in some kind of trouble, I want them to reach out and talk to me mm -hmm. so that I can give them options and not end up suddenly frozen out with no communication and not knowing what is going on. The other magical thing uh, when you're connected through your social network is that I've had people tell me that they've met people looking for money and they have chosen not to connect us. Mm -hmm. and, and what that means is that person has decided on their own to filter out that opportunity for me because they didn't trust that person who had come to them mm -hmm. that the opportunity would be a good one for me. And I'm perfectly willing to, to use other people's intuition in that way to help me avoid problems. Yeah. It's like having underwriters, like field underwriters. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and, and so like that, that's one golden rule. The second golden rule is that by doing the loan, I have to improve the commercial prospects of the enterprise. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a deal once for, and this is a great example I use all the time. It was for some guys who were doing epoxy flooring uh, in garages and they had to rent a floor grinder and they were going to one of those tool rental centers and they were spending hundreds of dollars every month renting this equipment. And they came to me and said, look, if we bought this equipment ourselves, um, we would probably save about half those rental fees by being, giving you a payment instead. So in that case, what I did is I used my capital. I earned a profit from these guys, but they saved mm -hmm. half of what they were spending with the rental center. And so there is nothing more secure than having a borrower who actually has more cash flow as a result of your loan, because your payments always come to you from the cash flow of that business. And if you can help that business improve its, its, its profitability, that just means that they're going to have an easier time paying you in the future. So this is in stark contrast, for example, to financing somebody's big screen TV. You know, I, like I wouldn't do that. That's just consumption spending. Yeah. In the case of the single wide mini home, for example, um, it was a it was a lady who had just been divorced. Her credit score was way down because of all the ramifications of the divorce. But owning the owning that trailer home and renting in the trailer park was a significant savings for her over renting a three bedroom apartment. And so it was exactly the same scenario. Um, you know, my loan to her meant that her personal cash flow improved mm. and that made her an even more solid, um, you know, person as far as uh, being able to, to make those payments. And from, you know, from the point of view of security, mm -hmm. um, if she didn't make a payment, uh, it meant that she would be giving up her home to me, you know, and, and there's all kinds of ways that we can, we can start to talk about, about how you secure your relationship, but it's basically done in the same way that banks do it. So when I made her that loan, one of the, one of the conditions was that I had to be put on as a first loss payee with her, with her insurance company. Mm -hmm. And I remember at one point during the arrangement, she changed insurance companies. And when she canceled the first policy, that, that insurer mailed me a letter yeah. mm -hmm. saying, you know, we're informing you that this policy is, you know, terminated. And it was like a 20 day notice letter yeah. or something. Yeah. So I called her up and I said, you know, you've canceled your insurance. She said, yeah, I have new insurance. And I said, great. I said, you're going to have to remember to put me on as a lost payee. Yeah. And I, and I got a letter from that new insurance company saying I was covered. And I, I also sent a letter to the trailer park management mm -hmm. saying, you know, if this, you know, I'm a lien holder against this home. If this lady is ever behind in her lot rent, 
contact me because I made that a condition of default. Yeah. If she didn't pay her lot rent, then she would be in default on my obligation as well. Yeah, this is the same with like a mortgage. When you finance a house, the bank requires that you're on the homeowner's insurance policy. They're on, they're on the homeowner's insurance policy. This way, imagine you have a $300,000 house that burns down and the bank is out of their money now. So yeah. to prevent that risk, the bank wants to be the first to collect the insurance pre- uh, claim. Yeah, exactly. And that's and like I said, this is this is how I learned to do this by watching those guys and seeing what they do. Mm-hmm. Now you mentioned um, you're connected to the borrowers. Is it also like geographically connected? Like, are they close to you? Um, everyone, every deal that I've done, the furthest one I've ever done was about a forty minute drive away. Okay. And and the reason for this is I like to be able to just drive by and take a look at the business. Uh-huh. Like sometimes there are signs that you can see, you know, things fall into disrepair, things look a certain way and you you start to question what might be going on there. And so just for my own peace of mind, I stay close to home. Um, But the other big reason why I want things to be more localized Mm -hmm. is that I ask people to guarantee the loans in, in a way that's different than what a bank does. So oftentimes if you go to a bank for a business loan, they're going to ask for a personal guarantee and and there's no conditions or limits on that. It's simply whatever amounts not paid, you personally are liable. If you don't pay, they're going to sue you. Mm -hmm. I asked for people to, to, for business owners to guarantee their loans to me in a different kind of way. So in every case, there's some kind of collateral and the, the less certain the deal, the more I might require of a down payment, for example. Mm -hmm. So if it's a $10,000 piece of equipment, it's my first deal with someone and I'm not really sure even though I do have an underwriting process, if I think have any doubts, I might say, you know, I'll do the deal, but you have to put 30% down. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I want to make sure that there's equity in that collateral at all times, but the guarantee that I will ask them to sign personally is not a guarantee on the amount of the loan, but rather a guarantee that they'll deliver the collateral if they ever come into default. And so here's where that's different. It means that if the business were ever to run into some kind of difficulty, that person knows that they're not going to end up in court with me demanding to, you know, money from them. Yeah. It, it means that it's safe to have an open communication with me because at the end of the day, they can wind up their business with me by returning the machinery or equipment. Okay. And what it does for me is it gives me an opportunity either to sell that stuff yeah. without having to go find it. Right. The yeah. last thing you want is to have to go hire a sheriff or a bailiff yeah. or a private, you know, PI to go find the thing. Right. That they they know they have an out, which is to be open with me, communicate with me, and bring the thing to me, and then I can go about either putting it up for sale, or what you know ideally happens is you just find someone else in that business who could use it, and you get somebody else to take over the payments, mm-hmm. and they just take over the piece of equipment and carry on. And in my book, I give plenty of examples of things like contractor vans, you know, like that, the, uh, you know, like the Ford cargo van that you see almost all the plumbers and electricians and carpenters use, you know, a a vehicle like that, for example, done on one of these local finance deals. If you ever had to take it back, you'd certainly find someone else in the trades who'd want to take over that, that payment and carry on using that piece of equipment. Got it. Now, as far as you mentioned bank on yourself, so for those who don't know, like bank on yourself is a concept that uses dividend paying whole life insurance. You could fund a whole life policy, borrow against it, and then use for, for things like this. Uh, mm-hmm. Are you involved in, in that kind of work or? or- so, so I have, um, I have such a policy and yeah. I'm, I'm lining up to get my second one actually. And so um, I'm funding the policy right now, but uh, I have yet to do a policy loan to do one of these deals, but it, it certainly is an opportunity for someone who is going to be thinking about this because mm-hmm. it would allow you to do, you know, like a, I, the, the reason why I got into this stuff and the reason why I still do it today mm-hmm. is because it has those high yields. And so most of the deals I'm doing are between 12 and 22%. Okay. And so what that means is for me, in, in, with a view to my in personal investing portfolio, I can have a small amount of money with these high yields. It means that I don't have to put the other stuff into risky investments. So it's a lot easier to sit on you know, guaranteed deposits that are earning quite pitiful rates of interest yeah. when yeah. some portion of your portfolio is earning a higher rate of return. 
Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it would work ideally with under a bank on yourself type of arrangement because you'd be taking the policy money out. It would still continue to grow in the policy yep. and you'd be able to invest it at some of these higher rates of return. Exactly. Which brings me to my next question. I was going to ask, what are you charging? So you said 12 to 22%. Is it yeah. like um, annual interest rates? Yeah. And, and so uh, really what I do is I just take a look around at what's going on. If, if you go to, you know, an equipment dealer, or if you go looking online and you find someone that sells equipment to contractors, for example, um, you'll find that they'll advertise all kinds of things with lease payments it's a tricky world. Uh, let me explain why. To really understand the, the rate of interest that you're paying on any kind of financing, you have to look at the flow of funds. Mm -hmm. So a business might advertise a lease rate of 5.9%, but then the fine print might say that the first and the last two payments are due in advance or first and last payment in advance and a security deposit equal to one month's payment is due in advance as well. Well, that means you're making three payments in advance. So have they really forwarded the entire face value of the equipment? No, they haven't. Yeah. Right. And so if you look at the actual amount of money that that was forwarded at the beginning of the arrangement, and then look at the payments, what you'll find is that 5.9 really translates sometimes into like 8.9. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so, so you have to study it carefully. And I, I walk through this with some people. Um, but here's the thing. If you're looking at absolute dollars, the difference in payment on a small deal, and what, what do I mean by a small deal? Like a $2,500 deal, a $3,500 deal. When you talk about the difference between, you know, 8% and 12%, you're talking about like 15, 20 bucks a month. Yeah. It, it's not a lot of dollars, right? And so when people realize that the difference in the payment is actually not that much in nominal dollar terms, but when they do a deal with me, it's not going to be going on their credit report. Okay. It's not going to be, you know, reporting and affecting them in all these other different ways. And if there's a problem that I don't necessarily have a personal guarantee for the money, they've got this other way out. Um, it means that some people who are perfectly bankable mm -hmm. end up coming and doing deals with me. And then that kind of answers the question as to why would people do business with you? Why borrow from you along other than the fact that they, they like to deal with people, not just faceless banks. It's also, it's not on their credit report and it's no, there isn't a personal guarantee. Exactly. And, and so I've got people now who I've done deals with over and over again, like they'll pay off one deal and then they'll mm -hmm. come back to me and say, now we're doing this. Can you finance this for us? Yeah. And so it's, a, it's a good working relationship. Um, I'm, you know, obviously putting my money at risk to a certain degree and I'm, I'm earning money off of that, but they're getting these added advantages that we just covered. And you know, at the end of the day, people don't necessarily want to be exposed to a lot of bank lending. You know, yep. there's, there's horror stories all over the place. I, I, because of the business that I'm in and, and, and now I'm in business, I help people buy and sell businesses. So I'm talking with business owners all the time. People who've been in business for like a couple of decades will tell you about the last time we had hard times and about banks calling them up and calling loans, yep. giving them 30 days to pay back lines of credit and things like that. And so, you know, people who've come of age and business in the last decade have never really seen any of the stuff that can happen. Yeah. Uh, people who've been around longer than that, they're a little more risk averse and a little more, uh, they, they tiptoe a little bit more around banks and bank debt. Absolutely. Yeah. There's actually a video on YouTube I was watching. It's like an hour long. Um, it's called like the horror of credit cards. And it talks about like the fine print in credit cards. So let's say for example, your credit score is 700 and then you go to a bank and you take a credit card from a $10,000 limit, the bank could actually change that limit on you. It says it in the terms and conditions. And then when they change that, the limit on you, that affects your credit score. And then when it affects your credit score, it affects the interest rates that you agreed upon. So they could change the interest rates. And then other banks could also change their terms with you based off of what that bank changed. So it's kind of like an inner circle of banks, like looking out for each other. And it, this is all in their terms and conditions. And they hire the best attorneys in the country, in the U.S., to actually like make it really complicated where other attorneys have a difficult time understanding those terms and conditions. So that's kind of like banking one-on-one, -on -one, 101. And I think like you mentioned, like people who, business owners who went through 2007, 2008, 2009, got to feel what that, what that was like. Uh, and the newer generation of business owners haven't really experienced that yet. But that's in the terms and conditions of, of the credit card companies and banks. 
you know, it's funny, Sari, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of credit cards. I use, I, I, I'm a master manipulator of all these different points programs and things yeah. that are offered. Yeah. Um, but the one thing I don't do is carry balance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, uh, I'll, I'll share that advice. In fact, I, I even, one of my follow on books was called credit card advantage where I, I show yeah. different small business advantages you can have through, through the use of credit cards. But one of the very first things I put in the book is you do not want to carry balance. Mm-hmm. It's it, you, any potential advantage that you might ever earn from any of those programs, as soon as you start paying interest, you've lost it all. Mm-hmm. And uh, credit card companies hate customers like you, right? Because they're not making money off of you. Oh, they're still making money off me. So, <laughs> yeah. so the, the, the way that the credit card system works yeah. is that if you go out for a meal at a restaurant and the bill is $100 and you pay with a credit card, yeah. the merchant only gets $97.50. Oh, gotcha. Okay. There, there's a discount rate. So this is how company like American Express, for example, yeah. for the longest time, didn't have credit cards. They only had charge cards. They had to be paid in full every month. Yeah. So they, they didn't have interest as a, as a revenue stream. All of their money was being made on what they call the discount rate mm-hmm. and there were the merchant discount or the merchant fee. And so even if you have a zero fee card yeah. and you've never paid one penny of interest, you are still making money for the credit card company. It's just being paid by the merchants that you're shopping with. And this is how they pay for rewards, like customer rewards is from yep. the merchants. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, so when you, uh, when you see that if you go to a certain kind of merchant, you get like a 4% cash back or yeah. whatever the, the award is, uh, it's not free money. It came from the people you just bought from. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah. Now, as far as like your lending, like, do you have like an official like lending business, like an incorporated business, or is it just to your personal, like just you personally? So it depends on the deal. So, um, for example, yeah. uh, whenever I do a deal for any kind of licensed or titled thing that would incur sales tax here where I live, if it was resold, uh-huh. um, then I do it within the corporate name because then the sales tax becomes a flow through thing. Uh-huh. Okay. So, uh, but if it's not, if it's just, um, you know, like a, like a loan, like two grand goes out and then payments come back in then I'll just do it in my personal name. It, it really depends on the deal and, and where the cash is that I'm going to use to do the deal. And all you have to do really is keep good records. If it's inside the company, um, as long as you're recording it properly in your bookkeeping, you know, what interest income you've had, then it's just going to you know be dealt with at the end of the year when you do your tax filing. Uh, personally, you just have to keep track of it again mm-hmm. so that when you go to file your taxes, you know how much interest income you've had. Just like... Um, yeah. how a, a bank will send you a slip if you've earned interest. Um, in this case, um, you just have to declare it yourself because you won't have anyone mailing you a slip. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. It's like the 1099 int form. So it's the interest you received. If you have a CD or bonds, you receive interest. And in, in this case, you have to claim that because nobody's sending you a 1099 int form. That's right. You're, you're the one creating the opportunity. So you just have to keep track of all the records and, and uh, be ready if anyone ever wanted to come and look at those. Got it. Okay. And then not to get too far into taxes, but typically that the interest that they pay you, if it's for business purposes, is tax, tax deductible to the borrower and then taxable to, to you, right? Well, if, if there are any business that borrows money for a business purpose, the interest is yep. like an expense. Okay. So I, I believe what you said is correct. Although I'm not a CPA. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. <laughs> Uh, what do you think about third-party lending sites? Like, so for example, like prosperlendingclub.com, YieldStreet, um, pretty much investing in some sort of platform that does all of the work for you. So I, I think they're pretty cool because mm-hmm. it can be a way for somebody to kind of dip their toe into this. Uh, a lot of those platforms you just mentioned do personal loans. And, and again, I'm not a fan of personal loans for any kind of consumption or debt consolidation or anything like that. Okay. I, I want to be able to make an investment that improves the cash flow of the business. And so th- th- what you're looking for is, um, you know, in, in uh, here in Canada where I live, I use mm-hmm. one called Lending Loop. And yeah. it's, it's all business loans, but you can participate with as little as $25. And it's great because you can basically put $25, $50, $75, $100 into a whole bunch of different loans. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are platforms, um, I think um, one of them is called SMBX is yeah, one yeah. of them that's in the States. Yeah. Um, and so these platforms exist that are purely for businesses. Yeah. Um, and that's the one that I would, I would be playing on. 
Yeah, I actually did an episode with the director of sales for SMBX. I think it was episode like 43 or 44 on this show. So yeah, he okay. talked about SMBX. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think those are a lot of fun and it can give you an opportunity to look at the disclosure information and take mm-hmm. a look at the financial statements and, and read their stories so that if you, you know, to give yourself a little bit of, um, a little bit of training and experience. But what I always suggest is that people stick to what they know. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're like a welder or a tradesperson yeah. or whatever, then do these small business financings in that space. So that if you ever ended up one day, for example, getting back some of that gear, you would know the gear and you would know that, you know, it's in good condition. You would have a better idea of what it's worth or who might want to buy it. Focus on what you know. I've had people buy the book. For example, there was this, um, this one guy, he was in uh, Pennsylvania. He was a pizza guy, very successful pizzeria, but like a lot of small businesses, his success was focused on a, on a hands-on management style. So he was there many hours a week and he was there every Friday and Saturday night late and he was making good money. And, you know, people were pushing him to take the next step. And, and for the longest time, he thought that meant open another location, but he didn't understand how he was going to split himself between the two. And that's what always gave him hesitancy. Um, So he had money accumulated because he was doing well in business. He got a hold of my book and he realized I can grow and do more with my, my earnings and my profits mm-hmm. by getting into this lending thing rather than opening another business. So what he then did is he started to go around and started to finance some of this pizzeria equipment. So he was familiar with the market because he was in the industry. He could take a look at a business, look at their traffic, look at their sales, look at their purchases and figure out if they were really making money or not. That industry has a lot, again, like the first example I used, a lot of people whose tax returns aren't really reflective of what goes on in the business. Well, as an expert in that industry, he's, he's able to really determine quickly what's going on in those businesses because he's got that experience. And, and so that's what he did. So he started to make loans in that space. Um, and you don't have to go far, for example, in the pizza business to be doing deals with people who are not really your competitors. Yep. You know, like, you know, a pizza business only sells pizza so far. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Every, everyone beyond that's not really a competitor anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Look at that makes sense. This is, I think, I, I love how you mentioned that because this is like we're thinking like a bank comes in. It's not just how do I open another restaurant and have to be there as well and, and, and duplicate my hours. Rather, it's how do I just make my money do bigger things and, and move and, and kind of like it has a compounding effect, right? Because if I'm loading money and I'm getting those in, principal and interest back and I'm building that up, I could then reinvest into other deals and keep it flowing, just like how a bank does it. A bank could control a billion dollars in assets from a small office of maybe 10 employees, if that, yeah. you know, it's, it's a smart way of, of working. And, and something I've talked about before we started recording is like, for example, like you have a tangible business, right? A furniture store or something else. And they want to start like an in-house financing company instead of going through other banks. They want to kind of um, recapture that interest in-house. So what do you think about that strategy? Yeah. So have you ever seen a a buy here, pay here, auto dealer place? Like Mm -hmm. it's the same kind of thing. Um, You know, Ford sells, uh, you know, commercial vehicles to contractors and small business people all the time. And Ford credit is often the the one who finances those acquisitions. And so I don't know if I would do it if I was a furniture store, but if I was selling any kind of equipment that businesses were using, Mm -hmm. then I would, you know, consider hey, maybe I should open up my own financing division, my own leasing division, for example. Um, And then you could do the same thing. You you could support the sales of your equipment sales showroom by being able to offer credit to people um, and have different programs, you know, for different credit quality and things like that. And if it was successful and you Mm -hmm. didn't have enough money to to fund all those loans and leases, well, then you use the portfolio of, of all of those debts or leases. And you use that as the collateral to go out and find investors or borrow from banks or other people. And so there's all kinds of examples. That's how leasing companies get started. They, they create these debts, they collect on them. Mm-hmm. And then and when they run out of money and they have more opportunities, they find investors and they use the existing portfolio as the collateral for the new money. And that allows them to continue another round of growth. Got it. So when I give, for example, somebody a loan, um, it's a liability on their end, but it, it raises my balance sheet. It raises the asset side of my balance sheet. That that loan document is an asset, 
Okay, got it. And okay. so, because it represents money coming in, mm -hmm. right? And so, just like a rental property has yes. income coming into it, right? And so, that note can become collateral for a loan from someone else. Got it. Okay. And then you help people do this, right? You have your book, you have your YouTube channel. Yeah. So, so the book that came out in 2014 is called Invest Local. And then I added a, um, an online course. It's about three hours of content where I actually go through some example files and, and the underwriting process on what I look at and what I ask for from people. And because I know your listeners are in all kinds of different jurisdictions, mm -hmm. what I do is I show examples of how you get the last part of the details based on where you live. Because in every state and every province and every country, mm -hmm. the, the way that security is registered, the way that titles are transferred and titles are documented, et cetera, is different. And I, I show some examples of how you find out that information, make sure things are done. And, and the last piece is simply that there's no better way to learn than to learn by doing. Yeah. And so my last piece of advice is that when somebody wants to get into this for the first time, is you find out what the limit is for your small claims court, wherever you live. Yeah. And you do your first deal under that limit. So that if anything should ever go wrong, you can usually take someone to small claims court by filing, you know, paperwork and $50 fee or something like that. Oh, gotcha. Okay. That's right. Nice. And so, so it opens the door to uh, afford an affordable arbitration ultimately uh, with the small claims court. And, and, you know, I'm not going to tell you to do your own paperwork and things like that. But here's the thing. If you're going to make someone a $2,000 loan yep. and you're going to earn a few hundred dollars over the life of that loan, you can well imagine that if you start to have attorneys do all your paperwork, that your profit's going to disappear. Yes. And so this is why there's advantages to using certain kinds of template and boilerplate type documentation that is very simple um, that you can get from different websites online. And, and I show you how to do that kind of stuff. Got it. Okay. I was going to say like the, a minute, I usually uh, nowadays, like the lowest attorney fees I've seen recently, is like a thousand dollars at the, on the low end. So if you're making interest, like $200 in interest, if that, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a, a, a smart move to do. Well, you know, I, I, I know that I've worked with some people who've created their own paperwork and then they yeah. paid an attorney to read them. Okay. Uh, like to give them a review. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and if you intend to do many, many deals, then that could very well be worthwhile. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And how can listeners connect with you and learn more about you? Yeah. So um, my main website is davidcbarnett.com. Most of what I've talked about over there is, uh, is related to buying and selling businesses, mm -hmm. but you know, it's interesting when I wrote invest local, I wrote it from the point of view of someone who wanted to make investments about a third to a half of the emails I get, and people still buy the book today, but a third to a half of the emails I get are actually from business owners who bought the book because they're trying to entice someone to make an investment in their business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And so it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? It's like, yeah. it, it's a business owner who's trying to get something done, who needs access to capital, who buys the book to figure out how they're going to make a presentation or present an opportunity to someone they think could be a, a good investor. And so um, I think if you're interested in this kind of stuff, the easiest thing to do would be go to Amazon, look mm -hmm. it up. It's invest local paperback, Kindle and audiobook. And uh, there's details in there and how to reach me, or you can find me on LinkedIn or mm -hmm. over at davidcbarnett.com. Perfect, David. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to put all your links that you mentioned in the show notes below. That way listeners could just click and connect with you. It was really nice having you on and I'm looking forward to bringing you back on the show. Oh man, it was a lot of fun. Thanks, Sari, for having me. Thank you. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you grow more wealth, please visit www.finassetprotection.com. That's F-I-N, assetprotection.com. The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal, accounting, or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.